only mode. All right. Good evening, everyone. Uh, for the purposes of our proclamations and um, recognitions tonight, we uh, are again meeting at 530. Um, just to go over those briefly, this isn't our official meeting, which will still be starting at six o'clock. So um, just bear with us as we go through our uh, proclamations. We've got quite a bit tonight, um, so I'm just going to kind of go through them. We have one, two, three, four, five, six. Um, six different proclamations uh we have some uh, condensed versions if anybody would like one read specifically we can but uh, otherwise i'm just going to kind of go through these um rather quickly so we can um move on and in my advanced age i'm getting close to scott's age here i need glasses now so um i mean, I mean todd's age sorry scott um right. <laughs> okay uh in all seriousness, here we go with the first one. Uh, declaring the month of April as National Autism Awareness Month. A proclamation declaring that henceforth the month of April will be recognized as National Autism Awareness Month. Um, and as uh, everybody knows, uh, um, the identification of autism has really um, taken off over the last probably 10, 15 years. Um, well, really 20 years. And, uh, um, you know, we, we have gotten to know more about what the disability means and and uh, the differences in, in the uh, different types of um, challenges uh, those who are, have that uh, deal with every day. So um, I just want to, as a city, um, just recognize this as well. And so now, therefore, the City of Council of the City of Fountain, Colorado, hereby recognizes the month of April each year moving forward, be recognized as National Autism Awareness Month. Um, the second one, declaring the 18th. Oh, oh go ahead. About that. We have uh, one citizen, uh, two citizens here that would like to speak about the autism. Oh, please come forward. Good evening. My name is Tia Perez, and we have been part of the Fountain community for almost four years. My husband served in the U.S. Army for 20 years, and Fort Carson was our final duty station. We love Fountain so much and the beauty that it brings that we decided to make this city our forever home. I have two children, a 13-year-old daughter and a 7-year-old son who has autism. As autism parents, we look for several things when it comes to our children. We want to make sure that safety is provided. There are various resources that will set our child up for success and recognition for kids that have autism spectrum disorder. For my son's services, we either go to Colorado Springs or Denver so that he receives the services he needs to thrive. One of those important services is ABA, which is Applied Behavior Analysis. This type of therapy is very intensive, and when children are diagnosed at an early age, the quicker their intervention, according to research, the better the outcome is for the child to be able to thrive successfully as they grow and become adults. Before Shanti moved to Fountain, I noticed a lack of presence when it comes to therapy such as ABA, speech, occupational therapy, feeding therapy, and physical therapy. As a parent, I would love to have access to those resources close to home but that is not always the case. Prior to COVID, I would pick my son up from school here in Fountain and then take him to therapy, which is about 30 minutes away. Yes, now we do have Shandy in Fountain, but there is a wait list. I think if we had more resources for therapy here in Fountain, many of us would not have to wait for months to receive services that our children really need. Currently, I have been trying to get my son into feeding therapy to help us deal with his limited food choice for almost four years. And we are still currently waiting to receive those services because the demand is so high. In 2020, the CDC reported that approximately one in 54 children in the US are diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder. That data alone shows the need for resources within our community. Safety is also a huge concern, especially when it involves my family. In 2018, I had one of the biggest scares of my life. My son and daughter were upstairs when I had a visitor come to my door. I was notified that my pipe was leaking on the side of my house, so I stepped out to look at the pipe so that I would know what was going on and to see what I needed to do to get it fixed. Without me having any idea, my son had come downstairs and went out the door. I had no idea that he was gone until I asked my daughter if he was still upstairs, and she said no. 
My heart hit the floor and I was constantly calling him. My son is minimally verbal, but will come when you call his name. He did not come, so I knew he was gone. This is the moment when I saw how awesome the fountain, fountain community really is. There were three cars pulling up to my driveway and one car had my son. Luckily, my son had my phone and they called my mom who gave them my address and brought him home safe and sound. I still do not know who those individuals were, but I am grateful every day for them bringing my son home safe. The road that I live on is a speed hazard. Even though the sign says 25 miles per hour, they do not abide by the sign. My son is older now, but still I am very conscious about him going out front because people drive so fast and it is dangerous for not just an autistic child, but for anybody's child. I have inquired about having a sign put in the area, but was told they no longer do so. And I have been told that I could purchase something to put outside my home. As a parent, it sometimes feels that people don't understand the magnitude of my concerns for the safety in the neighborhood. The speed is so bad in my neighborhood that we thought about moving so that we could feel safer. I feel that moving should not be our only solution to this problem, but it looks like it might be. I hope that one day something can be done to provide a safer environment for not only my family, but for other families in the area as well. Lastly, as a parent, I would love to see lighted up blue events in our city. By having these type of events, it would bring awareness and give us the opportunity to educate about autism spectrum disorder and provide resources to families in need so that they know help is out there for them and that they are not alone. Having lighted up blue events also brings families of autistic children together so that they are able to form a connection, share experiences, and offer support to one another. Thank you so much for allowing me to share my insight with you all. Thank you for coming. Um, it's someone else want to speak as well. Come on up. Hello, my name is Patsy Lane. Um, I have an autistic son. He is 18. He's about to graduate from high school. So um, with him, he's in one class all day and he's graduating from Sierra High School. So he's in one class all day um we try to put him with different students so he can get to know more um he's done all programs so with zary um being autistic is hard for him uh, he doesn't like to be around a lot of people mm -hmm. <laughs> so graduation is going to be hard for him so um that's just it I, i've we've had we did everything he has the resources so when he graduates He'll be going, he won't, he won't have a diploma, but he'll be going to the 18 to 21 program. Yeah. So that's where he'll be doing. So he could get used to being in large crowds. Yeah. All right. Well, yeah. And uh, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know if you guys know this. I'm uh, a special educator for 24 years. And so I worked very closely with um, students with autism and, and uh, actually it's where my career started is it was in an autism center based classroom and, and just, um, you know, uh, learning about that and, and figuring out how um, we can help better support them, but also help uh, everybody else understand what, what the world looks like for them and, and how they interact with it and everything as well. So I do appreciate you all coming out and sharing your stories with us. And, and uh, as we recognize this, I know for years now, April has been, been the autism month. And so um, it was good for us at school because we got to, we got to kind of put that out there for everybody. And it was a, uh, a uh, very, um, you know, it was just a fun thing to be able to do as as a school and 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 those types of things. So, um, congratulations to your son graduating this year and and doing that. And and I know what that's going to be like. And and best of luck to you. And and I, it is a proud moment for you as well. And, and I um, am excited for you and your family. Uh, transition programs are really good programs. And and the really nice thing about those is they they do try to do their best and and giving them skills outside of school and 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 helping them, uh, you know, become uh, citizens that, that can have jobs and, and do those types of things. So, uh, you know, and I know Harrison is actually the, the district where I started and they've got a great program there as well. And, and of course, I, I can't speak uh, highly enough about Fountain Park Carson, but, uh, um, you know, it's one of the, the better programs as well. So, um, you know, uh, we'll, we'll keep moving forward. Uh, the police department does work really well with uh, our district and, and they actually, a year ago, was it maybe two years ago, they, they even had a special patch for Autism Aware Month, Awareness Month. And, and so I know that they take it seriously a year ago and we, we didn't have COVID, or maybe it was two years ago, we had uh, autism, uh, had kind of a, a day at the 
fire department where they can come out and, and see the trucks and cars without all the noise and, and a really low key environment, but it allow them a chance to do that sort of thing. Did you have something to say, Chief? Or were no, you good? Just, uh, I'm gonna give you my card. So I'll give all of you my card. Please know how we can help. Uh, certainly we make special passes for autism. We have certain people, certain members of our police department, fire department, but also have autistic kids. So it's a soft spot in our heart. Prior to COVID, we always did events as the mayor spoke about down in our department. And uh, so it, it's great events. COVID kind of put that a little behind. We also have a home safe program, Safer at Home. That you can reg register your address and your autistic children with any needs. So that way, if we're ever called, it just gives us better information how to help your child. And that might be very effective. So speeding, uh, I live here in the city of Fountain. I absolutely agree with you 100%. They fly around my neighborhood too. I will give you my card if you email me. I promise you I, I won't be able to fix it. But I'll roll some heat in and I'll try and get some uh, some people to slow down. So I don't want everyone, anyone ever get hurt. I think a, a, a little girl, a toddler, five years old, got hit today and tragically lost her life. So mm -hmm. I know that's every parent's worst nightmare. So I'll give you my card and please know how I can help. So thank you for coming. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, that, again, for everybody who's listening or, or whatever, um, that, that is a program if you have a, a child with a disability. And and uh, it's, it's great to register with your local. Um, uh, PD and fire departments so that when they are called out to those areas, uh, they know what to look for. And it's uh, one of those situations that hopefully we can prevent some bad things from happening because a lot of times people just don't understand and, and aren't aware enough to to look for those clues and those signs. So um, we try to do our best at the city to to um, to get ourselves prepared. And, and honestly, I think we've done some trainings with the school district, the special ed department to um, uh, better prepare our our police and and fire departments in in working with families who have um, uh, family members with any disability really and so um, anytime that those sort of things come up they they've been very gracious in in helping us uh, do a better job at at dealing with the situation as well so uh, we'll keep working and then on the speeding uh, we get I know for myself personally and I think everyone up here we get numerous emails and phone calls and. And uh, you know we we try to hit as every every uh, area as much as possible, but uh, people just uh, lately feel like they can not obey the traffic rules. So I apologize for that, but we'll we'll try to do better. Okay, thank you. All right, all right. We'll move on to um, our second uh, proclamation or appreciation. Uh, oh, is this Carl's? Where's Carl? There he is. All right, declaring. Um, let me start my camera back on. I'm sorry. Um, declaring the 18th day of the April as Line Worker Appreciation Day. A proclamation declaring that henceforth the 18th day of April will be recognized as Line Worker Appreciation Day. And uh, we do have Carl Christian here who is a um, uh, kind of, I don't know, would you call him a guru of line working? Um, legend, a legend of co uh, line workers. But uh, uh, we do have some great line workers uh, that work for our, our community and and keep our power on and and ensure that you know um, when the lights go out in other cities we're going to be good and, and taken care of. So um, a good group of people that that work tirelessly in some very hard and and adverse conditions and and they're just some great people that uh, we know that work here and and choose to live and 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 work here as well. So Carl, pass our appreciation along to the guys and and ladies out there and and. Uh, um, as we move forward. Um, so now there, did you want to say anything? No. Okay. All right. Now, therefore, be it proclaimed that the mayor and the city council of the city of Fountain, Colorado, recognize the line workers who so diligently protect public safety by making sure that electrical power continues to flow to the homes and businesses of the city and surrounding communities, despite severe weather, accidents, and system malfunctions, and hereby proclaim 18th, April 18th as Line Worker Appreciation Day in support of the contributions of these brave employees. All right, and next is uh, declaring the week of April 5 through 11 is National Public Health Week. Uh, proclamation declaring that henceforth the first full week of April will be recognized as National Public Health Week. And of course, as everybody knows, in the last year we have um, really relied on these folks um, very heavily. Um, because of the pandemic and everything that we have going on and um, just their work has really come out into the forefront and and we know they're there and we're happy that they're there but uh, it's really helped us in this time that we've been dealing with uh, the pandemic and COVID and everything related so um, thank you all um, for 
doing that for us. Um, now, therefore, be it proclaimed that the City Council of the City of Fountain, Colorado, does hereby proclaim the first full week of April's National Public Health Week. I call on citizens, all citizens, private businesses, nonprofit organizations, and other groups to join in activities that take action to acknowledge and recognize our public health workers. Next, declaring the week of April 22nd through the 26th as Administrative Professionals Week, a proclamation proclaiming henceforth um, the last full week of April as Administrative Professionals Week. Uh, as any good organization knows, um, without our administrative professionals, we wouldn't be able to do our job. And they are truly the heart and soul of what we do in, in any organization, any business, whatever it is. Um, they keep the grills, uh, the wheels moving and, and greased and, and making sure the operation is running smoothly. So to all of you out there that, that work tirelessly for your organization, we do thank you. Um, now, therefore, be it proclaimed that the mayor of the city of Fountain, Colorado, does hereby uh, proclaim the last full week of April's Administrative Professionals Week, saluting the valuable contributions of administrative professionals in the workplace. Uh, next is Proclamation for Purple Up Day, recognizing the month of the military child. A proclamation proclaiming henceforth April 16th as Purple Up Day in honor of the military child. And we know, um, especially here in our community, the, the sacrifices that um, all families have to make, but in more, more in particular, those those uh, sons and daughters who have to watch mom and dad go off and, and be gone and take care of the, the work that they do as they volunteered. And um, so there's a huge sacrifice for them and, and everything that, that uh, occurs in that life. And um, I've growing up here in Fountain, I've known so many uh, Army brats and Air Force brats and and just the things that they have to go through with their dads being gone. Luckily, my dad was already out of the Army by the time I, I came around. And um, you know, I didn't have to worry about him being gone and, and have to worry about those kind of things. But um, uh, we do want to recognize those folks as well. Um, now, therefore, the city of Fountain recognizes April 16th, 2021 as Purple Up Day in honor of the month of the military child and encourages city of Fountain in partnership with military installations and local organizations to observe the month with appropriate ceremonies and activities that honor, support, and thank our military children for their service. Make sure you're wearing purple those days as well. And it looks like our last one is declaring the week of May 2nd through the 8th as Municipal Clerks Week. A proclamation proclaiming henceforth the first full week of May as Municipal Clerks Week. I think we'll, that'll, that'll be it on that one, right? <laughs> no, they, uh, you know, again, clerks like administrative professionals, they really do keep things moving for us and, and ensure that, you know, um, the business runs and, and further, you know, especially here, um, we are very fortunate for our clerks and, and the things that they do for us because um, I certainly could not do the job I'm even close to be able to do without the, the support of Sylvia and Joni and, and just the things that they do for us. So um, with heartfelt and deep uh, gratitude, at least for me, and I can speak for everybody else, you know, um, this job would not be anywhere near as easy as it is. Um, without this expertise and support that we get from those two ladies here here in particular. Um, anybody else would like to comment on that one? Yeah, go ahead. I just would say I've worked with a number of city clerks over the year and uh, over the years. And I just, number one, have a huge amount of admiration for the profession in general, for the work that they do, as you guys all know. Uh, but in particular here, having the opportunity to work with the, with um, both Sylvia and Joni here at the City of Fountain, I mean, we we have got the cream of the crop. And uh, and I would just say that both Sylvia and Joni just do a tremendous job. We just could not do it without them. Right. It's just the, For me, it's the amount of stuff they need to know and can just get it. And it's like it's not even an issue, it seems like. So um, I do appreciate that as well because, uh, again, it would be difficult at best. Um, anybody else? Go ahead, start down the road. I would just like to echo those comments. Um, Sylvia and Joni have, again, I keep saying this over and over, I feel like I'm a part of this big happy family and um, they have the, the amount of professionalism that they share, uh, the knowledge that they have. Uh, I see Joni a lot, uh, she's you know coming out in the community and again, these ladies are the cream of the crop and we are so, so lucky to have them a part of our, 
our family that we have here in Fountain. I would just like to thank Sylvia and Joni both. Uh, I couldn't have done this for the last seven and a half years without them. <laughs> And I can't tell you how much I appreciate all they do for us. Sylvia, I think you and Joni are about the best we could ever come up with. Thanks a lot. May not seem like much, and sometimes it doesn't feel like enough, but um, thank you. Thank you very much. You have, as everybody else has said, you've made this as easy as it could possibly be when it's not an easy position. Um, to do and you guys have just the way you handle everything it's not that you handle everything but the way you handle everything that makes it easy and reward easier and uh, way more re rewarding than this probably should be so thank you so much all right okay and so with that we will go ahead and finish this one off. Um, just making sure no one online wants to speak. Um, now, therefore, I, uh, Gabriel P. Ortega, Mayor of Fountain, Colorado, do recognize the first week of May as Municipal Clerks Week and extend further extend appreciation to our municipal clerk, municipal clerk Sylvia Huffman, and to our Deputy Municipal Clerk Joni Carneal for the vital services they perform and their exemplary dedication to our city. Um, so with that, we don't have to do a formal vote on any of those. So we are good. Um, and again, in perpetuity, we, we have just proclaimed those. So um, they, and now future mayors or councils may want to change that a little bit, but um, you know, it's just, it makes it easier for us. And, uh, but thank you all to have came here tonight to speak up on certain proclamations or um, those who are here every night and working for us and, and taking care of this. So. Thank you all. And then, so at this point, we, we've got about eight minute break um, before we start a regular council meeting at 6 p.m. So we're gonna go mute here and we'll see you back at six.
Okay, testing. I can hear you, Sharon. Oh, good, thank you. What just happened? That was weird. That was weird. <laughs> so you're good. Secure. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> All right. Good evening. And welcome to uh, our first city council meeting for April. It is April 13th, 2021. It is 6 p.m. Uh, please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Can we have ro roll call, please, Ms. Huffman? Mayor Ortega. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Lauer. Here. Councilmember Thompson. Here. Here. Councilmember Estes. Here. Here. Councilmember Applegate. Here. Councilmember Geek. Here. Councilmember Duncan. Here. Five members present in council chambers, two virtually. Yep. Okay. And uh, I did see Sharon's. Um, earlier like a, right before we started her mic was on but i didn't hear anything but we heard you that time when you said you're in so um we got both of you there uh we will continue moving forward we're on um oh first of all i'm gonna let yolanda go ahead and do the particulars around um because we got quite a bit of people online so if you don't mind doing the the particulars about the um meeting thank you mayor for those online, these are instructions to help you navigate the attendee pane. You will see these four buttons, and if you press the orange button with the white arrow in it, it will open up the attendee pane so you can see the full screen. All attendees' microphones are muted. There are two ways to communicate with City Council. The first is to raise your hand by clicking on the hand button on your vertical menu bar. The second is to type a question into the question pane in the attendee interface. If you are not connected to the web presentation, you will not be able to raise your hand or ask a question. Okay, how to raise your hand. Click on the hand button on your vertical attendee bar. When your hand is raised, the arrow will turn from green to red. Then a member of the staff will call on you by name uh, that you registered with and will unmute you. How to ask a question in the attendee pane, type a question to city council or staff members. In the pane, the staff will read the question out loud and direct it to the appropriate party. Um, if the question pane is not visible, then click on the orange arrow to open up the attendee pane. Thank you. Okay, thank you for doing that. Um, as, as well as those who are online, um, if you raise your hand, uh, I will get to you as quickly as I can. Uh, I have others who are kind of keeping track as well, just in case I miss. Um, it might be easier as well just to write your question in the question pane, and I can um, read it off and ask or answer those questions as they come up. So um, just for everybody who's online that wants to um, participate. Um, okay, we are on item number four, which would be presentations, uh, board commission committee appointments. We have none tonight. Um, that are listed. So we'll move straight into City Council agenda requests and announcements. I will start with Ms. Duncan. Okay, good evening. I just would like uh, one thing to say is that the um, Fountain Youth Council is holding a book drive. We have these really pretty flyers. Um, hopefully they'll be in our papers soon. 
So if you have uh, any gently used books, we'd like to have those. Our collection points are City Hall on 116 South Main Street, Customer Service Building 101 North Main Street in the Police Department, 22 North Santa Fe. And that's all I have for right now. Okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Geek, anything? Nothing tonight. Uh, Mr. Applegate? Uh, nothing tonight. Okay. Uh, Ms. Estes? Only thing I'd like to say Only is, thing I'd like to say is, is that CU is now offering people to be able to schedule their own COVID vaccine appointments. So you can do that online. Um, it just came out in the news tonight, just so you're aware that you can do it yourself now. So that's all I have. Okay. Uh, Mayor Potem. Yeah, just a quick thank you to Todd and Troy for handling the, the two single holler public meetings. Uh, a lot of good feedback, a lot of good questions and answers. Um, that's going to be an interesting, an interesting exploration as as questions and answers continue to flow uh, through. And looking forward to the next one was in mid May, May twelfth. I think that's virtual only, right? Looking forward to that. Um, it's nice, and and on that exploration of that, it's really nice to see some public involvement when you ask for public involvement. It's really nice to actually see that happening. Uh, whether all the questions get themselves in kind of a loop or whether the questions bring a completely new perspective you never thought of, it's all good. It's all really good. And I was really excited to, to see so many people participate in that. So I just want to say thanks to you guys for doing that on a Monday night and a Friday night. That was good stuff. Thanks. Okay. Uh, Ms. Thompson. Yes, thank you. I yeah, hope y'all are doing well today. I was, um, I missed the um, proclamations at the beginning, but I really appreciate the um, autism awareness proclamation. As a family member who has someone that has that issue to struggle with, um, I appreciate it very much. I'd also ask that people, when you're thinking of autism awareness, it is an entire family um, event. Uh, your other children are, are learning to live with this, other family members, grandparents, everyone. So if you know someone that has autism, uh, don't be afraid to reach out and ask questions because each family's situation is different. Each child is different in their developmental needs. And uh, the only wrong question is the one that you don't ask uh, on how you can ask or uh, help or be of assistance. And uh, that goes for just about any anywhere in your life because the schools can't do it all and the parents can't do it all so any help is, is always appreciated um also i'd like to thank um the humane society for bringing their wellness wagon down here at the end of the last month i heard it was a really good event and they were so excited with the participation from the entire fountain valley that they're scheduling a second one to come back so I think that's a really good thing to help our citizens out with some low cost vaccinations and a quick check on your animals to, to see if they need to further follow up with your vet. Um, on Saturday, right before Easter, we had a large meeting up in Centennial Hall to discuss the Highway 115 infrastructure needs that have to happen. Um, to me, that's just as important as the gate 20 that's gonna be, gate 19 that's happening down here. Uh, it's another entrance to Fort Carson and serving those people on that side of the highway. So as part of being PPACG and the transportation commissioner hat I wear every other year, um, Stan Vanderworth was there, the commissioner and uh, representative uh, Bradfield was there because it's their areas and uh, they're collecting information from people who live on Highway 115 area on uh, possibly some acceleration lanes there, deceleration lanes, turning lanes, uh, if you've driven Highway 115, you know it's pretty narrow in some spots, bridge re re reinforcement. Um, so they're in the information gathering stage right now. So uh, you can always contact PPPCG or myself or Commissioner Vanderworth if you have some concerns or thoughts on that area. And then later in the week, CML sponsored a call with both senators from Colorado, Senator Bennett and Senator Hickenlooper. I had to pause to say that one the right way almost called him governor and uh, 
But one thing that was really, really stressed from the many people who were on that call from all around the state was flexibility of federal funds coming for projects and how they're going to be uh, distributed. And uh, so uh, each unique entity has their own needs and what fits one isn't going to fit the next one. So that's why there's going to need to be some flexibility on how the funds uh, are used. But of course, no framework yet or timeline on when those funds are coming. So that's it. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Ms. Thompson. Um, the only thing I have uh, is kind of just to follow up to Greg's comment about the um, single hauler conversation. Uh, I was on both nights as well. Um, a lot of interesting questions, great questions, a lot of interesting theories as to why we're doing this. Um, I can assure everyone who um, is, is wondering what's going on with that, this is totally uh, an outside the box thinking that other communities do. Um, and so we're, we're exploring that option for us. It's not a done deal. Um, no one up here has made the decision yet. Uh, I can tell you honestly, I don't know where I stand on the issue. I see the goods um, in, in, in going to a single hauler and those types of things. I don't know um, where I am on, the, on, on the, the bads of it, but I know there are some there, some potential pitfalls that we're gonna deal with. Um, uh, but again, just uh, I encourage everyone to get on our city website. There is a uh, link to um, the message board in regards to this, so you can go on and uh, uh, ask questions. You can make comments as to what you think about the project as well. Um, and as we move forward, we'll we'll, we'll certainly take everyone's um, opinions into mind and and uh, realize. And as as a, a participant did say, you know, there in the crowd that particular night, I think there were four people, five people uh, from the public here. There was about I don't know, 10, 10 to 15 online um, who had, you know, were or there to talk about it. Um, but there are 33-ish thousand other folks here that uh, haven't said anything yet. So, you know, we hope that we get more participation and just people commenting and and please do that. We, uh, if, if you have experience with it from another part of the country, um, good or bad, we need to know that. Those are the types of things we wanna know as we make a good educated, um, thought process on this and, and moving forward. Um, and to kind of piggyback on Ms. Thompson's um, thing is, is uh, the only bad question is the one you don't ask and you assume. And so don't think you 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 understand it um, by based off of something you may have heard or read on, on Facebook. Ask the questions, we're, we're here to answer. It's all transparent, there's no, nothing to hide here, um, but we're definitely um, here to answer those questions and and make a good decision that's going to benefit not only the entirety of the city but you know everybody that that takes advantage of those sort of things. So um, obviously there's going to be some things we didn't think about, some things maybe we overthought, but uh, that's that's the point of this whole process. So please um, do give us information on that. Uh, so thank you to everybody on that. Um, our next one is public to be heard. Item number six: Citizens may address the council on items that are not on the agenda. We ask that you email your questions to the city clerk. Prior to the meeting at council meetings at fountaincolorado.org, um, council may not be able to provide an immediate answer, but we'll direct staff to follow up. Out of respect for the council and others in attendance, we ask that you limit your comments at three minutes or less. Um, I'm going to start with in person, and I have uh, one card, Mr. Lender. You want to come on up? Good evening. I, uh, Al Linder, REA Road Fountain. Um, I didn't know you were gonna start the meeting earlier, although I'd be here when I heard about Sylvia and uh, her assistant and so forth. Congratulations, she's, you, you know you deserve it. So <laughs> she's a spectacular person and that's all there is to it. Yep. Um, I'm here tonight. I was gonna say a few other things, but I decided not to at this moment in time. I'll save it for another time. Um, Ms. Duncan, um, I haven't met you yet. Um, congratulations for being up here. Um, but somewhere along the line, if you have any time, I know you don't represent me, but you do. Um, I'd like to talk with you. Um, anyways, tonight, I just want to say a couple quick things. Um, we do have a lot of employees in this city of ours who are pretty tremendous and they need to be recognized. So I want to do that. And um, 
I'll bring it right off the bat because I talked with Todd about it. Bob McDonald. Wherever I go in this city, he's out there. I've never seen a supervisor do that. The man is everywhere. The man is good. He was a fighter pilot, Apache helicopter pilot, officer in the army, ran the SWAT team as a sergeant. And now we have him here. He's awesome. Mm -hmm. Second, Sergeant Steele. Is, it, is he a sergeant? Corporal. Corporal. He deserves to be a sergeant. Three. Tremendous, tremendous, tremendous individual. Whenever I go around, I see him on a corner with that gun. I see him pulling people over. I see him talking to people. He's one of the most professional people, cops, that I know. He needs to be recognized. Now, last, you are very, we all are very, very, very lucky to have Todd Evans amongst us. Because I told Todd yesterday, I believe he cares about the fountain more than he cares about where he lives. So, and it's all because of you. It's all because of you. You've done a fantastic job. And I thank you all. All right. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Lender. Um, I wish you don't do that about Todd in front of him because it says it's really big. Yeah. Um, but uh, <laughs> um, yeah, it's it's hard to get him out the door. But uh, you know the. The folks you did mention, you know, and Mr. McDonald and, and the stuff that he's he's brought for our, our, our roads and streets. Um, we're a lot further with the limited amount of money that we have for that that um, particular part of our budget. But uh, um, he, he has got a way of thinking about those things and, and moving us forward in that. And of course, Officer Steele or Corporal Steele, sorry, um, mm -hmm. he pulls you over and he makes you feel guilty about getting pulled over when most others, I think, would uh, you just really don't want to see them. And uh, he's got I think Greg said it at one point that uh, he what you said, but he just um, I don't know, he's just got away and, he, and he's very professional, and very respectful. And and uh, um, but be careful because he will give his own mother a ticket. So um, he, he does not worry about that. So uh, thank you for your kind words for everybody, Mr. Lender. And and uh, as, as usual, please um, let us know if you need anything. Uh, any others in public that need to speak on anything? Okay. Uh, Ms. Huffman, did anybody um, for online? Okay. And I'm not seeing any hands go up. Okay. We will go ahead. Um, and uh, Mr. Rainville, go ahead. Uh, Oh, uh, Mr. Alan Rainville, uh, who's online, he just said, uh, I would like to acknowledge Todd and Troy on the presentation and review on the single hauler waste removal. So I know he was on one of those nights as well. So thank you for your comment, Mr. Rainville. Okay. Okay, we're going to go ahead and move on to item number seven, our consent agenda. All items listed under the consent agenda are considered to be routine and will be approved with one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a council member or citizen requests in which case item may be removed from the consent agenda and considered separately at the discretion of the council. We have items A, B, C, D, E, and F. Um, uh, I'm looking online to see if anybody's turning on, uh, if we need to pull anything. If not, what would council like to do with the consent agenda? All right, Mayor Pro Tem. I move to approve consent agenda items A through F as presented. And Ms. Duncan? Okay, we have a motion and second for approval um, of our consent agenda. I'll let Ms. Huffman with the call. Mayor Ortega, how do you vote? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Lauer, how do you vote? Yes. Council Member Thompson, how do you vote? Yes. Council Member Estes, how do you vote? Yes. Council Member Applegate, how do you vote? Yes. Council Member Geek, how do you vote? Yes. Council Member Duncan, how do you vote? Yes. Seven yes. Motion carried. 
Okay, thank you. Um, we'll move on to item 8. 8A, uh, old business, second reading of ordinance number 1761, an ordinance amending the official zoning map of the city of Fountain from the regional commercial RC district to the multifamily MF district for property sometimes known as Garrison by Watermark, generally located at the southeast corner of Mesa Ridge Parkway and Metropolitan Road and here and after more specifically described in exhibits A and B. Ms. Martinez. Thank you. Uh, this is the second reading of Ordinance 1761, which was a rezone request uh, from the Regional Commercial Zone District to the Multifamily Zone District for a multifamily development to be known as the Garrison at Watermark. Uh, there have been no changes to the ordinance since first reading. Okay, thank you. Um, with that, no changes. Uh, I'm not seeing any questions or comments on this one. Okay, Council, what would you like to do? Uh, Mr. Geek, I make a motion to approve on the second reading ordinance 1761. All right, and Mr. Applegate, second. Okay, we have a motion and second for approval. Ms. Upman, Mayor Ortega, how do you vote? Yes, Mayor Pro Tem Lauer, how do you vote? Yes, Councilmember Thompson, how do you vote? Yes, Councilmember Estes, how do you vote? Yes, Councilmember Applegate, how do you vote? Yes. Councilmember Geek, how do you vote? Yes. Councilmember Duncan, how do you vote? Yes. Seven yes. Motion carried. All right. Um, we're going to move on to item nine, new business. Nothing was taken off for the consent agenda, so we'll move on to item 9B. I'm opening a public hearing and a request by Kim Lee Horn and Associates on behalf of Rivers Ventana LLC for approval of an overall development plan. Amendment, amendment number three for Ventana for property generally located east of Old Pueblo Road and north of RMB Court, Fountain, Colorado. Before we get started, um, for those of you who are online, and if you are here in particular for this item, um, the applicant has provided a uh, presentation. Uh, there's a video apparently that um, is in a high definition uh, type of video. And so if you are online and you have a low bandwidth, you may have trouble seeing that video. Um, if you want to see that video, um, I'm sure we can figure out a way to get that either posted or um, emailed to you um, if you would like. Just get a hold of um, uh, Ms. Huffman at the city clerk's office and she will um, get that to you. So, uh, Ms. Martinez, go ahead. Thank you. Good evening. Christy Martinez, City of Fountain Planning Department. Uh, the item before you tonight um, is the Ventana Overall Development Plan Amendment Number 3. The property is located at the northeast corner of Old Pueblo Road and RMB Court. Uh, the area being considered as part of the Amendment Number 3 is an area known as Ventana South, which is the lower half of the existing residential development, and the property is currently zoned the Planned Unit Development District. In the spring of 2020, uh, city staff worked with the developer to hold a virtual community meeting. Their community meeting occurred right as uh, the nation was shutting down due to COVID. Um, so we did have a very successful community meeting at that time, solicited a lot of feedback from the existing and surrounding residents um, based on their current plan that they were proposing to submit to the city for their amendments. Staff did review the comments that were provided by the public um, and to the developer to ensure that all previous developer requirements had been uh, fully addressed um, and satisfied per the city approvals. Staff also worked with the developer to incorporate additional open space and amenities within their plan. Some of the feedback that staff received um, through that community meeting was a desire by the community to have a larger clubhouse or an additional clubhouse because that type of amenity was um, optional and was provided at the developer's um, own will, the city doesn't have the ability to require any additional uh, clubhouses to be provided or an expansion to the existing clubhouse. As I mentioned, the property is located at the northeast corner of Old Pueblo Road and RMB Court. The entire Ventana development is approximately 178 acres. However, the amendment considered tonight is approximately 57 acres. The proposed change would be to convert the uh, commercial and business park land uses, which are currently um, allowed, to primarily residential. The developer is proposing three types of residential lots, um, the residential small lot, the residential standard lot, and an attached residential product for uh, patio homes. And they're also retaining a, a commercial acreage of about three and a half acres along Old Pueblo Road. 
The residential small lot would encompass approximately 20 acres. The minimum lot size in that area uh, would be about 3,300 square feet, which is similar to the small lots that are provided within the Ventana North development. The residential standard lot is approximately 18 acres of the development with a minimum lot size of 4,500 square feet, which is similar to the existing standard lots within uh, the Ventana North. Their new product is the attached residential, which is about 10 and a half acres of the development, which are proposed for patio homes. Within that patio home development, those interior streets would be privately maintained by either the Metro District or a separate homeowners association. The commercial com component, um, as I mentioned, is about three and a half acres that's fronting along Old Pueblo Road. The proposed uses within there would be convenience, general, and specialty retail. Um, it would also allow offices and restaurants as long as there wasn't a drive-through uh, facility. These types of commercial uses are similar to the commercial uses that were allowed under the previous amendment. Um, I do want to note that neither staff nor council or anybody associated with the city can determine what type of commercial entities or specific businesses can go into that area as long as the commercial allowed, um, usage is allowed under their ODP or their overall development plan, that use would be allowed. They're also proposing an expansion to the community clubhouse land area for a possible expansion to either the clubhouse or adding a splash pad in the future of approximately half an acre. And then in the lower southwest corner, they're proposing a, a stormwater detention pond. So just to kind of recap there, um, so to the north would be to the left of the screen. Area C is what they're proposing as their small lot, which is consistent with the existing small lots to the north of it. Area D is their residential standard lot, which is similar to the lots that are at the further north end of Ventana North. With their proposed patio homes adjacent to the community clubhouse, and pool area, and again with their commercial land area with frontage along Old Pueblo Road. There is a planned write-in, write-out access onto Old Pueblo Road, which will serve the, the commercial area. There's also an access point on RMB Court, which will access the residential standard lots. Um, and then there's also the extension of Traders Parkway from the Northern Development down to RMB Court. The city had worked closely with um, Challenger Homes and entered into a, a memorandum of understanding in 2019 to fund transportation improvements in this area that were greatly needed. We did come to the agreement with Challenger that they would fund $1.8 million of improvements in this area. $1.3 million was um, allocated towards the cost of the future Indiana Avenue uh, railroad crossing which is anticipated to start construction, assuming all goes well with the PUC and the railroads uh, later this year. And then $500,000 was allocated towards improvements on Old Pueblo Road, um, which were completed last year. Those improvements included the widening of the lanes uh, due to the limited right of way that we have in that area and adjacent open space and private property. We weren't able to add any additional lanes. However, we were able to widen the lanes to provide for safer tra uh, traffic flows and are providing a uh, center turn lane um, along Old Pueblo Road. I would like to note that the final payment with the MOU for the $1.8 million was provided to the city at the end of March. This area is located within the Calhan drainage basin. Um, as required by the city codes and regulations, a full spectrum detention pond is located in the southwest corner of the site, which is directly to the south of the commercial land area. All PUD residential areas are required and commercial areas are required to provide minimum open space requirements. Based upon the 57 acres, acres of this amendment, they were to provide 12.9 acres of open space. The developer is providing just slightly over 16 acres, which includes various open space tracks throughout the development, walking trails, and a 3.7 um, or 3.77 acre park that's located in the southeast corner. I would like to commend the applicant for working closely with city staff and the parks department to integrate the comments that we received from the public to provide those open space amenities and park amenities within that development. Their proposed park will also include their playground equipment for various ages, a half court basketball court, and a parking area uh, to alleviate some of the on-street parking and put that into the park area. They're also providing a 50 foot wide buffer adjacent to the railroad tracks um, on the eastern side of the, of the development to provide an additional buffer to those <coughs> residential lots that may be in close proximity. 
So their park area, um, again, has the playground with the hard court basketball with the parking area off of a future roadway. Um, so for perspective, R&B court is just to the right. The city has also been working closely with the uh, developer to provide uh, utility services to the area. They have worked closely with the utilities department to provide an offsite water system um, and offsite improvements for uh, water mains to be provided in their uh, development. In order to provide the domestic water service and the necessary fire flows for this development, the developer uh, will need to install offsite improvements, which will include an extension of a 12 inch water main from RMB Court south to the existing 36 inch main that's contained within Link Road. And then they will be extending the 36 inch water main to the west over um, Fountain Creek and connecting into the existing main um, in, in South Santa Fe. The developer is also working with the utilities department um, to negotiate an agreement with the developer uh, for the construction of the offsite water mains. So for visual purposes, um, RMB Court is at the northern um, end of the picture. That red line depicts the extension of the 12 inch main into the existing 36 inch main within Link. There, the existing 36 inch uh, water main is currently stubbed to the west side of Old Pueblo Road. They are working uh, with the developer to extend that 36 inch main to the west across Fountain Creek and connecting into the existing water main that's within South Santa Fe. The future comprehensive land use plan uh, for this area does call out village center and business park and industrial. The proposed request to the amendment to the development plan is not consistent. However, staff is supportive of the deviation due to the limited truck access that's available along Old Pueblo Road and the RMB Court. Staff finds that the overall development plan amendment for Ventana is consistent with the review criteria outlined in section 1722030 of the Fountain Municipal Code. This item was presented at the March 2021 Planning Commission meeting, at which time the commission made a recommendation of approval of five to one. And tonight's recommendation staff is to recommend approval of ordinance 1762 on first reading subject to the condition that the execution of a water main extension agreement between Rivers Ventana LLC and the City of Fountain for the construction of the offsite water mains is completed. That condition of approval of, has also been incorporated into the ordinance tonight. Are there any questions for staff? Do you have any questions for staff? Um, Mr. Ratner? Yes, Mr. Ratner. You said that the business area would have to fight in and fight out. Correct. Correct. Due to the classification of Old Pueblo Road in that area, we are limited in the number of access points and full movement access points that we can install along um, Old Pueblo Road. So in order to provide commercial access to Old Pueblo without having commercial traffic go through the residential area, that was the um, highest and best access point that engineering felt comfortable with providing along Old Pueblo Road. Councilmember Applegate, can you please turn on your microphone for our overhead, those online? There we go. Yeah, you know, my feeling is that that's, we need a waiver there or something because that's going to be, it's going to be hard on the businesses too. People come from one direction, just don't want to deal with all that probably and then go out and go the other way. Ray, did you have something to say on that? No, just telling uh, Richard. Oh, okay. I thought you needed to say something. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, it's hard to see with this. I with can't this even TV find it. it. It's hard for them to get to it. So I'll, I'll try to help you and get it through. Um, and mine's off. Sorry. Uh, okay. Sorry. Mine was off at that time. So good Lord. Okay. Um, any, uh, Mr. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem, sorry. Yeah, I've got a couple. Um, one of those is you say Planning Commission recommended on a five to one. And I, I these days, I'm really interested in the, the one that said no and why? I mean, not necessarily the person, but why did they say no? They felt that based on the community feedback that was received at the planning commission, that there was some uncertainty from the residents as to how to proceed with the development. So they weren't comfortable making a favorable recommendation without some 
adjustments um, in terms of timing of whether or not commercial development provided or came in within a certain time period and then could resort back to a residential development. Hmm. All right, and then um, just from a utility standpoint, are we comfortable? I mean, there was some already some discussion with another development on not having enough water tap availability. Is there, are we comfortable on this one? Yes, um, we've checked available taps and Ventana South is good with available taps. All right. And then one last utility related thing, because any more utility stuff is really, really high on my attention list. Um, Carl, are you comfortable with additional electric loading at that end of town in that, that, that part of town? Uh, yes, Th this particular development has been in our strategic plan for uh, quite a few years, but this will pr be pretty much the max that we can go as far as south uh, okay. with our current infrastructure. Oh, awesome, thanks. Okay, and I'm sorry, on, on for those online, the question that uh, Council uh, Councilman Applegate asked was just around um, the right in and right out, and so that's what uh, Christy was um, answering and so if there's further on that we can definitely um, kind of explore that a little bit more. Um, Ms. Thompson? I think my question might be more for the developer. Is he going to have a question time? Yeah, the, the, he's. He, I think they have a presentation and then um, as I said earlier I don't know what your bandwidth is like out there but just in case um, his videos uh, are I guess they're HD so if you have a lower bandwidth um, from what we're hearing from IT it may not play well in those areas of town where the bandwidth is a little low. So just to give you a, a, a yes heads up on that. Okay, I'll wait till after the presentation and, and ask my question of him. Thank you. Okay, no problem. All right. Okay, no more questions for staff. Anybody in here? Okay. All right, um, Christy, thank you. Thank and then you. we'll let uh, the applicant come up and. Thank you, Council, and uh, my name is Jim Houck. I'm with Kimley Horn, and with me today is uh, also Jim Beyer with Challenger Homes, here to answer any questions you might have. Um, as we kind of get into the presentation of our, our material, really I think staff has done a great job. It's been really helpful to work hand in hand with them. It's been, uh, they've given you a great presentation of covering the details. What we were hoping to do is to catch some air here, um, is to give you a little character of the community as we, as we see it moving forward. Uh, it's a little bit beyond what the ODP uh, parameters really are, but we want to give you a, a sense of where we see it going as it relates to actually north and, and moving into the south as well. Um, so let's see if we can make this work. Hey. <laughs> that's that's not the presentation, sorry. <laughs> there we go. If for I guess for context, you know, our agenda really here was to give you a little more neighborhood context uh, as it relates to the proposed amendment, a little comparison of what was proposed originally and what's uh, part of this request, and then just kind of a, some update on the residential, commercial, and the open space amenities as we move forward. And we do have some, as I've mentioned, a few clips that would help illustrate this. So thank you for your time. Uh, again, for context, uh, I'm assuming everybody knows where we're at, but just in, in the sense of how it relates to the community, uh, let's see, there's something here. There we go. We have the we have the creek uh, along the west side of the site. North is the existing development that's uh, been completed to date, and then we have obviously the, the, some of the schools in here for reference, as just for context of the community itself. And as mentioned. Uh, R&B Court is our southern edge uh, along Old Pueblo Road for context. As we move forward, um, 
we do want to thank uh, staff for helping us facilitate uh, an online neighborhood meeting. Uh, there was some good good feedback and some good participation, and this is just kind of a, a glimpse of, of some of the things that were captured during that meeting. Um, but we did have about 74 participants, and uh, we had a good collection of comments that uh, were all kind of worked through with staff and make, made sure that responses were sent back to the staff, uh, community on those specific questions that they had. Um, we do, we do like some of the things that that do support the project, and in, in you know as as it relates to open space and in the kind of con commercial or commercial uh, downscale uh, version that we have cr proposed here um, through that meeting it was it was very uh, greatly appreciated the input. Um, the existing ODP again identified a larger light industrial commercial zone um, than what we're proposing today. Uh, you can see <clears throat> we will continue to, as, you, as we move into other plans, you'll see that the commercial retail does continue to uh, anchor here on, this, on the west side of the site. I guess just for context too, as, as we move forward, these, forward through these slides, we've kind of tipped the project sideward. So north is always gonna be to our left and south to our, to our right. Again, here's the here's the project in uh, late 19, 2019. Um, our larger undeveloped areas is our uh, site today. The proposed uh, project area uh, really begins to develop. Uh, whoops, really begins to okay. Let's back up. Begins to develop a very familiar pattern of residential. As we move across the site, across the south, uh, the park that Christy had alluded to is here, kind of in this upper right-hand corner, and we'll show some more images of that coming up. And then, as mentioned, also the retail down here uh, along uh, Old Pueblo Road with the right-in, right-out discussion, uh, and the clubhouse as well as for for ori orientation. The comparison. Um, we want, thought it was important to kind of share of really what this begins to look like. So the light industrial originally was 40 acres. So that then it uh, becomes uh, zero acres within the new development, but we do maintain uh, the commercial aspect of the site. Commercial goes from 15.5 acres to 3.8 acres. The residential goes from 70 acres to <clears throat> total for the whole site from 70 acres to 112 with about an additional 270 units. Our open space goes from 55 acres to 72 acres. And something that came out of the, the discussions with the neighborhood and under planning commission was a talk about trip, trip generation changes. The existing um, site as it sits today, uh, the traffic reports indicated about 340 Trips per acre, and on, a, on on the new proposal, we're dropping down to two point or two hundred twenty-four trips per acre. Um, so you can kind of see the difference between residential and the commercial industrial land uses on this on the transportation system. Overall, the residential is is really the focus of the of the development. And what I'd like to do is you can kind of see how these units have been highlighted. We want to kind of fly through some of these and give you give you a good example of of what uh, is anticipated uh, with the development. And we'll do this in three phases. <clears throat> so this is really the presidential product line that Challenger produces uh, on the north. And this is really uh, we'll fly through north here. Let's see if this works. There we go. Um, this is the existing neighborhood, and you begin to see some of the uh, the differences in the different units, the architectural styles, also the open space there to the upper left, 
All this will be consistent with what is being proposed for South. Uh, the same type of product and lot sizes will transition through uh, to the South for about a little more than a third of the, of the project area. Um, <clears throat> And you can see the little light, the light, the green line on the right-hand side gives you kind of orientation to where we are on the site here mm. with the drone flight. But again, maintaining these connections into the open space, the amenities um, will continue to be a part of the story as we move to the south. The next uh, area of of interest for us is really this new product called the Ascent it comes with some variations, it gives um, home buyers some other options. So we're looking at, at a, just a smaller smaller footprint within the, the building itself. Um, the lots are very comparable to the rest of it. To the upper corner here is another little fly through of a project that was just completed. With this same with the same housing type, you'll see that these are a little narrower footprint. They don't have a three-car garage option, uh, but they do have some two and three-story uh, configurations and a lot of architectural uh, variations that are provided. Again, the front yards will be the focus of giving lots of uh, options for individuals to personalize their their properties uh, as we move through this. Just give you a sense of that. And again, you can kind of see coming up here, this pedestrian connection, again, connecting the neighborhoods and the neighbors and the open space together. Uh, the third product is the patio homes that Christy had ind indicated is kind of another new one. It's an attached product. This is uh, again around a kind of a semi-private uh, section of the of the development uh, does have the private streets and these will be main by the maintained by the the hoa um, and the metro district agreements so this for context again we're going to kind of fly from left to right through or from i guess east to west through the project area just to give you some sense you've seen the ascents there around the park the presidential units uh, that line up kind of along pres um, trader Parkway, and then the patio homes has this kind of this separate little section here. It's not a gated community, um, but it does have its own kind of little character in neighborhood settings built around a green courtyard. Uh, just to give you an example of that, this is that architectural style and kind of landscape settings that we're hoping to develop here with this one as well. So this is an, a recently developed Challenger project. Um, so it gives you a sense of some of the backyards, the open space, the architectural features of the of the product. And again, it, always kind of focusing a little on some of the open spaces as a key part of the neighborhood. <clears throat> now, get, talking about those open space and those connections, uh, we wanted to capture some of the trail circulation patterns that we're proposing will be consistent with with what we are hearing from the neighborhood about making further connections and loops for the trail system out here in Ventana, uh, connecting to the open or to the clubhouse, the open space pockets, as well as just general light, general buffers and greenways around the property itself. Um, Let's go to the next one. Here's a, just a little fly through on the park itself to give you a sense of scale and its relationship to the units. Uh, again, just kind of a placeholder, but identifying some playgrounds, some hardscape uh, pavilions and such. As we move forward into the phases of, next phases of design, we definitely would get into details and work through that, um, continue to work that with staff. Uh, also mentioned here, and I'll, I'll leave the uh, invite Mr. Byer up as well to talk about this, but we do have a couple slides just to quickly kind of recap on the traffic MOU and in, in the water extension. Uh, 
Di mana? Good evening, everybody. Jim Byers, and I'm with Challenger Homes and Rivers Development. So, as part of our ongoing conversations with um, city staff and the issues that have um, been prevalent with your traffic concerns, we agreed back a year or so ago, a little bit more than that, to work through some issues that had existed with the um, Metro District and trying to get some funding for you all to address Indiana, et cetera. So as part of that conversation, um, Challenger and Rivers stepped up and agreed to help fund those projects um, to the grand total of $1.8 million. So with that, um, we kind of went through and decided that, you know, it's a, it's a big chunk to bite off all as one. And we set up a payment program that was fulfilled at the end of March. Um, there was a brief little hiccup on a couple of things, but before it's all said and done, we were able to get everything paid to you all. The current conversation um, regarding the extension of water um, is also a big ticket item. So we have kind of done the pro forma work on our end to see how that impacts our ability to pursue a development on this site. That project comes in at about $2 million, um, give or take 100,000, depending on where the bids finally come in. And we have been negotiating a, a an additional memo of understanding with Troy and Dan Blankenship with utilities to structure a program that would allow that to take place as well. So those are two of the kind of the big, I think, um, components that show that we are um, continuing to work with the city of Fountain as um, partnership for lack of a better description, I guess. So um, over the years, um, Fountain has been very good um, ground for us to to develop and to provide housing for everyone so we expect to be able to continue that without with um, without a lot of problems as we know that there are more buyers out there and uh, we think that it's going to be continue to be a good partnership for the city jim did you need me to advance anything here or is this Okay, which which Christy kind of touched on earlier and showed what that extension looks like. It's a significant project, as you guys know. Um, crossing under the creek is is a challenge, and um, we're up for it. So I think I would like to stay up here and address questions if you all have them. Okay, um, so we'll. Uh... The way, since this is a public hearing, I know it seems like I have folks online that may be from the neighborhood that want to speak or ask questions. So I'm going to, the way, um, let me take this off. The way our public hearings go, we, um, I get counsel to ask questions and, and do those sort of things first. And then I will um, come to public and, and go through those uh, separately. So at this point, I will look to counsel if you have any questions um, in regards to the information miss thompson go ahead yes thank you that was a great video and i i was actually able to see it um uh, on the park these are these are questions for the developers on the park is that going to be um ada accessible yes perfect thank you um on one of the ones i that you were showing i'm i'm sorry it might have been the presidential area it looked like there was is there only going to be parking on one side of the street because that street is narrower mm, no so typically what we'll have in the the higher density areas um on street parking is usually accommodated well isn't 
allowed, frankly, because because lots get a little too narrow. So we prefer to have folks park in the driveways um, on the, the higher density. In the patio home area, the street cross section is a little narrow, narrower, but we provide uh, parking spaces, visitor parking spaces in that type of application. And um, again, people are expected to park in their driveways. Right. Okay. You just always get the families that, you know, have one or two mini cars. So, <laughs> and then also on the patio home area, and I want to make sure I'm understanding patio home correctly. That's like a one level home. Actually, actually they're, they're a, a rancher with a basement. Okay. And a finished basement, all of them. So you end up with a bedroom um, on the first floor typically and then two bedrooms and sometimes three in the at the lower level um, it all kind of just depends how the the buyer wants it structured but for all intent it is a rancher with single full floor living and bedrooms below too our typical buyer on those are actually retired folks or people that are downsizing from selling their big family home may not be retired at the time, but are looking at, you know, that's where they're going to retire. Right. I know there's a great need for that in the in the area in general. Um, and then also on that area, um, so when you say attached patio homes, is that like a duplex or condo type? Home. Yes. It, okay. Be, and then was there no sidewalks in that? Because from the photo, it looked like um, they just didn't, it was hard to tell from the, from the presentation. Um, so we have developed those in Colorado Springs where there is no sidewalk. I don't know that we've gone to that level of detail on this plan yet. So the, the flyover that, that you saw the, of the right. constructed project. There are sidewalks that, paved sidewalks that kind of meander through the open space. And, but it, as far as along the street side, there are no sidewalks. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Okay, yeah, I think it was the way it was explained to me in the past that it really kind of, you're, you're, trying to force the residents into that open space and enjoy yeah. that area. So, exactly. And as you know, if you're going to provide all this enhanced open space, you want people to right. utilize it. Right. Okay. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem. Thanks. This might be a, a dumb question, at, at least at this point. Uh, for those areas with the higher density, um, has FIRE already looked at what the potential road widths are going to be and they're comfortable with that? and their turn angles and so forth. I mean, I, I would have assumed so, but I just wanted to make sure. Yes, Mr. Lauer, on every plan before it gets to you, we've made sure that all public safety is taken care of. They see the turning radiuses and things that you're talking about, and it's designed to meet those. And there is specific requirements that they have to meet for the fire code so they can get in and out of there. Thanks. And, and, and just so everybody's clear, on the higher density sections, the road width is the standard public accepted right of way. It's the patio homes that propose the, the private. Ah, thanks. Um, Mr. Geek. Uh, how many units total are you talking about here? Uh, I think we're at about 260 right now, 270. Okay. Um, and the patio homes are gonna back right up to the residential or the commercial? uh with a buffer with a landscape how buffer. much of a buffer um because if we have no control over each uh, commercial i don't want to have a problem with the people that think they cut it. i don't how, can i back this up to site plan but i don't know which arrow i should push i'll end up with mayor ortega up here and while you're doing that, Jim, uh, Sam, a good example I can give you is going to be the uh, the new dollar store over Countryside North, that type of buffer, as well as uh, what we've got in Cross Creek with um, 
all those areas just to the north of Cross Creek as well? So we have, so this would be the landscape buffer that I was describing. How much are you talking there, 20 feet? Well, let's see. I would say that that is at a minimum 25 feet, but I believe that we actually provided more than that, didn't we, Jim? Okay. So you could put bushes and stuff, trees. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Ms. Duncan? Just for clarification, you said there were or were not sidewalks um, on the street side. So um, on the fly through that you guys saw of the actual constructed, on that particular project, there were no sidewalks on the street side. I don't know that we're at that level of detail on this, um, you know, at the ODP level, but you can see the the use of the interior walkways again through here that are really the the system that allows pedestrians to move through the site. So they will be able to move in the you say in the center right here, but <clears throat> if uh -huh. I was handicapped and needed to get to the street from my home. I'm just trying to see how is this accessible for someone that has a disability? Well, that's, I think that's a great question. And like I said, I, I don't know that we've worked through that level of detail on this, this section of the, the plan. Okay. Um, we're at the ODP level right now, not the final plat. So if I, if I can help with that question, sure. I guess maybe, um, uh, again, the, the point of, of, of this is I think the streets are a little bit more narrow here. And so really the, the, the intent is to keep as much foot traffic off of that street. It's really just intended to drive in and get into your garage or your driveway and park. Um, but really it, the drive is to get people into that open space. To, it's, it's more of that community feel where back in the old days, um, where you know everyone was out on the street playing here, it kind of reverses and you're in 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 that open space. To the, uh, to the yeah, end. and so everything would be as per law uh, accessible um, for um, ADA requirements and things like that. So those things will be taken into account. But again, it really is just that's the intention of, of the this kind of type of and I that's my best way of trying. Oh, to I help. think that's a very good description. Okay. All right. Uh, anything else, Ms. Duncan? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Mr. Applegate? Yeah, on that little inset here on the picture, it's showing in the, around the park and those little uh, low density or high density houses, it's showing a sidewalk on the side of the road. It, it, Will that be there? So uh, in this section here? No. Or, oh, the, so you're down, that, you're down there here. On the left, upper left corner. A little picture. Oh, okay. So that's that's the park, and this right. this and where area, the houses are, it's showing a little sidewalk in front of them, and you're saying correct. there's no it, sidewalk. No, no, that so in this area here, this basically, if you can follow the uh, green light, everything in this, you know, 75, 80 percent of the site develops just like everything has ever developed in the city of Fountain meeting the the, the right-of-way standards sidewalks etc the section that is questioned about how sidewalks work is on the patio home and that is the attached product everything else is single family detached with traditional sidewalks traditional roadway widths yeah, so this is just in that one specific area where they have the as he said the patio homes um, and so again, this is this is not at the point where we're at the final plat where this is a final design. Um, this is kind of more, it's it's more than a concept, but it's not final. If that's a good way to put that. Okay. And see no argument. I'm I'm doing an okay job, Mr. Great. Uh, I'll let you present next time. Okay. Um, I come with a fee. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, any other questions from council for either applicant or Ms. Martinez on this one? Go ahead, Mr. Geek. Uh, yeah, there, there'll be an HOA, you said? There would be an HOA only for the patio home section, the attached product. And primarily because it has this private road 
um, system. And it has some additional open space that essentially works for those folks that live within that area. So typically when we develop this, we, we end up with a wall or enclosure type area around the perimeter of that development. It's not a gated community, so people are free to access and it, it doesn't hamper fire or public safety, but it gives a sense more or less that this is a private area. And so that's the purpose of the HOA. Otherwise, everything falls under the, the metro district, the existing metro district. Okay, and the metro district takes care of all the, the complaints as far as uh, people parking over sidewalks mm -hmm. or putting their motor home in the driveway or that kind of thing? Yes. Okay, thank you. Okay, at this point, I think that's it for council. I'm going to go ahead and move to public. Um, I do have one question um, from Mr. Rainville. Uh, so far, according to uh, the, sorry, according to the December 2019 traffic impact MOU, the developer would pay 3,600 a lot for 1.8 million. Does that take into account the added residential lots? I believe the presentation stated 270. It does. Think, yeah, it does. Yeah, um, everything's covered on that. So um, hope that answers your question, Mr. Rainville. Anybody in here have questions? Okay, one more time, and is this a public hearing? Are there any other questions from either council or public? Now would be the time. Okay. Um, Okay, uh, Mr. Uh, Morse, Jay Morse uh, says, I have concerns about the parking area behind Benicia. Is that correct? Behind Benicia. They're looking, um, yeah, Benicia. I don't, I'm not familiar with Benicia other than property that is further south off of um, Wilson. So the T-shaped end of the street uh, of Benicia, B-E-N-E. -E. Did we name these streets already? Oh, Miss Martinez is. Oh, I can't speak to that, but. Oh, yeah. So I think it appears that he's referring to this hammerhead here. We have another one at this end. And those hammerheads are specific um, for fire. So you can, yeah, so you can get a fire truck down there and turn it around or any other type of emergency or large vehicle. Okay. I don't know if you heard that, Mr. Morse. Um, let's see. Will there be a privacy screen? I, I'm assuming you're asking I, at that same area um, for the privacy screen. Um, again, I, I don't know that it's been thought to that level of detail, but it would it's adjacent to a common open space that is a 50 foot um, buffer between um, the existing filing one lots and anything that we have proposed for this. Okay, um, Yolanda, is there a way to uh, put the mouse on that so that people online can see this? Because we can see what what he's, this, this is, again, let me pause here for a second on this um, presentation. Uh, Colorado Springs City Council is updating their um, their council chambers and there's been a little bit of heartache about it. But because of COVID and the pandemic, it's really forced them to think about how we need to present better for the public in the event that we need to go through this again or go to, and this is this is my um, kind of soapbox here again, pausing the presentation, that we desperately need to do the same thing here. Um, uh, the, 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 what we have here and, and things are going on 
and trying to do this virtually at the same time just doesn't work. So it's more of a, a plea to council, not so much staff, because I've, I've talked to you guys about it, um, but something that we need to fix because um, it's hard to go back and forth with people who are online and, and virtual and, and try to explain that. So Yolanda, if you can move that, um, to that same spot where can you point for yeah for Yolanda? Yolanda if you'd like to follow the green light so he he's asking about this area this is a challenge or if you can give me the the um the control I don't know how I can take the control of that if it's possible I just want to make sure we're talking about the same spot as Mr. Morse. Um, and again, he can't see what he's pointing with the laser pointer, and I want to make sure that we're. Um, oh, I'm going to change presenter. Hold on. Okay, I can change presenter. Uh, uh oh. Okay. Uh, hold on. I'm sorry. Online. Oops. You guys can. Oh, hi. <laughs> um, this is not working. Okay, how do I get back to, oh, and then, never mind. Are you City of Fountain organizer? Yeah, if you can just use the mouse, that would be fine too. Oh, it's a, there you go. Okay, That's Mr. Correct. Morris, if you see the mouse, is that the exact spot you were uh, referring to? And if you have a mic, if you want to uh, speak, you can as well. I would just need to unmute you um, on my end. Okay, go ahead, Mr. Morris. Yes, hi. I'm sorry. It's Mrs. Yes, Morris. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> um, Yes, that's the correct area. Yes, that's the correct area. Yeah, so so that area has a 50-foot buffer that would be that is where the trail system comes through. So from the back of existing filing one to the uh, next home is a minimum of 50 feet. And, and will there be any like will there be any trees, trees or hedging trees or hedging because we when we bought this home they we bought this home they included a gate that opens up to that back walking path and it, it feels a little unsecure with parking or i feel like there's a lot of traffic that's going to be coming through there and i i just i'm not loving that So um, to answer the landscape piece, yes, it will be a landscaped trail system, um, typical to what we've done throughout the neighborhood so far. The, the one question I'm not sure how to answer is trees, um, because there is a existing gas line that goes through there that may impede our ability to plant trees. Mm -hmm. but it would be landscaped. And there's, there's no consideration for just making a circle there or something where people are not likely to park? Well, you wouldn't have parking there. It, it actually would be a fire lane. So... Um, it would be illegal to park there. Okay. Well, that makes and, me feel a little and, better. 
just to make sure you're we're talking about that red where that red spot is yes that's correct okay yeah and so the yeah that's just a turnaround for public safety um and really i don't <laughs> the only two that may potentially park there would be those people that, that live in that area there but if they make it a fire lane it would not be uh um, available for even them to park so um yeah it will be a fire lane okay okay thank you okay thank you sorry about the the mix up there on the stuff okay um any other questions I'm going to look at council one more time. Okay, I know you um, answered a bunch of questions at Planning Commission and, and did a lot of work there too and kind of alleviated some questions and answers. At that point, um, you know, a lot of work has gone into this development. I remember 17, 18 years ago when the previous um, owners <laughs> wanted to bring in rail serve industrial and um, the amount of heartache and things that went into that meeting. I, I remember sitting right where you are and just listening to um, uh, all the comments and things and it really um, uh, brought to light everything that uh, you know could potentially go wrong in a development. I think what's going on here, the work that you guys are doing off-site to help us with our concerns have, have, have really been um, beneficial to the community and, and making sure um, you know it's a win-win for everybody so I, I i do appreciate the the willingness to actually work with the city and, and do those sort of things as well so um uh, mr rick you have a question yes sir just a quick statement sir uh council's got a choice on this uh they can deny the request and it'll stay as commercial or industrial and then we would have 53 foot trailers potentially with hazardous material coming down illinois coming down old pueblo road uh, to this site or we can approve the the council can approve this request and we can get old pueblo road and blue improved and get indiana finished which is what the voters had asked us to do with moving fountain forward. So those are your two options, essentially. Which one you go with is your choice. Thank you for listening. All right, thank you. Yeah, we're we're aware of that. And um, uh, again, we we uh, uh, are appreciative of everyone who's come out to speak. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and one last chance close the public hearing. And unless there's further questions or comments from city council, um, what would you like to do, Mr. Applegate? Yeah, I make a motion to approve ordinance All right, and a um, bunch of lights went on. Mr. Geek, go ahead. I'm sorry, can we have the motion repeated with the microphone on? Okay. okay. I got it. I can't even find it most of the time. Okay, you want to repeat it? I make a motion to approve ordinance number 1762 on first reading subject to condition. And I second it. Okay, that was Mr. Geek that second. We have a motion and second for approval. Ms. Hoffman? Mayor Ortega, how do you vote? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Lauer, how do you vote? Yes. Council Member Thompson, how do you vote? Yes. Yeah. Council Member Estes, how do you vote? Yes. yes. Council Member Applegate, how do you vote? Yes. Council Member Geek, how do you vote? Yes. Council Member Duncan, how do you vote? Yes. Seven yes. Motion carried. All right. Thank you. We are um, and uh, looking forward to the products and, and things that you're bringing in. And, and variety is good. I don't know that I would like it a whole lot. I'm the I moved out of the the, the small um, neighborhoods, but I I know there's it's it's, it's um, just what's out there. I was in Fort Collins over spring break and a lot of the Fort uh, community or the, a lot of the communities like that already. So um, a lot of people love it. So thank you. All right. Item number 10, correspondence, comments, and ex-official reports. I'm going to start with Mr. Trainer. 
Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of the City Council. Um, just have a few things I want to report briefly. One is that our uh, legislative committee continues to meet weekly and we continue to monitor some of the bills that are impacting municipalities. Um, that committee is made up of uh, Councilmember Duncan, Councilmember Thompson, uh, myself, and our City Attorney Troy. And um, <clears throat> just uh, want to make sure that we're all monitoring some of the different I'm not going to go through the bills, so don't worry about that. But just that that you're aware of some of the bills that are out there, and they're continuing to be submitted as well. So um, we're just really trying to stay up on top of that. We issued an RFP this last week, speaking of legislative issues um, for for lobbyist services. Um, so that was one that we've talked with uh, the council about in the past, potentially partnering up with um, Monument to do a joint lobbyist sort of um, service. We're gonna we're put out the RFP, we're gonna see what the uh, what proposals come back to us and see if it's something that we can actually afford. It really probably won't benefit much from it this session, but just seeing how much is going on, it's really important that we get ourselves prepped for next session. Uh, events are starting to open up. Just a quick heads up, we have uh, Thunder in the Valley and the Fountain Fall Festival that are both now in their planning stages and are planning to be in person and doing their events this year. Um, and then the last thing I want to say is the dial, the COVID dial is going away on Friday. Um, we're still waiting for direction from the state and just for reassurance, we will continue to uh, coordinate with our county health on any any steps that we need to take here. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I think it's worth noting as well, because I know people are tired of this. Um, we're, we're in a, the city of Fountain is really not going to in a position, I think, this is personally, um, going to take a position on these things without the health department's recommendations and th they're the ones that have been kind of guiding the ship in the middle of this pandemic anyway for us and it wouldn't be in our best interest that because we have some angry citizens that feel like we shouldn't be doing things and be the lone lone guy out so i um i'm just going to put that out there if, if you disagree with that i'm sorry um but uh you know we're, we're going to take our cues from the uh, health department and uh, let them continue moving us through this as as they have been doing a great job with um, and again you may believe in it you may not you may have your strong opinions one way or the other but um, for the uh, you know the 33,000 people that are here and 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 even the more in a greater uh, valley we uh, we owe it to ourselves to take this thing seriously and and do the best we can with it we're all sick and tired of it but at the same time um, we got to take we got to take care of ourselves so thanks scott for the update uh mr evans to your point mayor um everybody knows the struggles we've had on the first floor in the last several months so this thing isn't done yet and yesterday my son's football team had eight of their players that tested positive oh geez so it's coming into the into the younger generation so we're not done yet just to your point so that's all i've got mayor okay thank you uh troy uh, thank you, Mayor. The only thing that <clears throat> I wanted to mention is um, we are the PUC is considering a rule change uh, for railroads and uh, basically an increased accountability for them if if they miss time frames um, and and kind of drag their feet like they are notorious for doing. And so we are we're working alongside many other municipalities in in Colorado to to support um, and and work with uh, with the PUC for some really good rule changes to help increase the accountability to get the railroad to do what what we need them to do and, and increase safety on the crossing. So uh, we'll be filing along uh, filing alongside many other municipalities um, that happens tomorrow and then kind of starts the process. So I'll keep you informed as that goes along as well. Okay, thank you. Um, Carl, anything from utilities? Uh, no, sir. Nothing tonight. Thank you. Right. Other, the kind words. Thank you. Oh, you guys are awesome. You know it. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate um, that's it. the one job uh, PD couldn't do. So no, we're um, there. You guys we're there heroes. All right. Thanks a lot. <laughs> oh, Chief Heber, go ahead. Generally, we made great progress with the SLO bill that was killed uh, up in the House a couple, couple weeks ago. That was all hands down effort. That was a really good outcome for our city specifically uh, because we really have a true model program here. Uh, lastly, uh, a proud report that we'll, we'll, we sent our third traffic officer um, out on the streets in March. He will be joined by the fourth traffic officer in June. 
Uh, those three traffic officers, the first quarter of 2021, issued 400 traffic citations. So there was about 200 warnings given out. So we are really trying to do everything to encourage our citizens to slow down. This last two week reporting period, we focused up on the Mesa. The previous two weeks, we had nine accidents. It was all hands on deck up there. And over two weeks, as of yesterday, there were zero accidents up on the Mesa. So we really try and move those resources to the hot spots uh, around our city uh, to a positive impact, which is keeping our citizens safe. Our beacon, uh, I sent you guys an email, I think two weeks ago, we had a beacon candidate. We interviewed, we really liked her. She did a ride along. I think she found out what the hours were gonna be and, and I pulled her application for the job, not to worry. Uh, we have three more interviews uh, scheduled. We did one today. Uh, this one we really, really like. She's actually worked with law enforcement, uh, both for law enforcement first responders and the jail population in two different jails. So I think she's gonna be, you know, maybe already programmed uh, for work hours and what she's gonna face. So we have two more interviews to do. We'll hopefully get our beacon. Uh, and, and I just trust in that, that we'll get the right person for that job. You know, lastly, I'll just say there's been uh, the events this week. We, we've seen a couple of tragedies. Uh, that occurred out there. One, uh, we had a repeat tragedy of a, a young man that was tragically shot uh, and killed up in Minnesota. Um, we had, uh, you know, many of us have seen a video of a, a lieutenant in the army that was serving out in Virginia where a couple of cops really uh, did not treat him. You know, we're very proud of the way we treat our, our veterans. We're very proud of the way we treat our, uh, our military people, our citizens, and our relationship with Fort Carson. You know? So for me, you know, I want to quickly do <laughs> uh, secondly and lastly there was a you know there was a, a state trooper in uh, new mexico that was tragically shot and killed on the side of the road so it continues to be a hard environment out there um i just want to tell you that we as a staff we look at each one of these cases we try and not be the overall judge but we try and identify lessons learned for us as a police force whether they're character based de-escalation based policy or training based and try and make sure uh, we learn from them so we don't have them here so we can even can you stay on that we'll be talking to police officers tomorrow about all those different incidents and uh i just want to say to all of you uh, thank you for your support i said that very much to miss duncan and miss sharon when we were doing a legal update i just want to continue to say thank you very much many of our law enforcement communities are down 20 15 percent of their officers across the board we're very proud we hired our our last officer two weeks ago to bring him pull up he's got a great story he was born in mexico he migrated seven years old here to this country didn't speak uh like english and joined the police department last week so he's going to be a great fit he's a really super family guy so thank you very much all right thanks chief um i'm going to look online if i'm missing anybody um uh, paul can you hear me are you you got anything from it or yolanda there's paul uh yeah i'm here uh and i have nothing this evening thank you mayor i appreciate it okay thank you paul uh, Mr. Trilch. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Uh, the only thing to add this evening is to just come back to the single hauler um, initiative for a moment. Uh, we made it uh, as, as easy as possible to gather information and provide feedback for citizens on that initiative. Go to the uh, City of Fountain website. Right at the very top, there's a green banner that says single hauler initiative. You can click that link and uh, it will take you to a page that has videos recordings of both of the public sessions. It has a copy of the feasibility study that the city completed. Um, it has a link for a blog that's on the website where citizens can easily provide feedback. So it's kind of a one-stop shop for that single hauler initiative uh, topic and uh, I encourage everybody to check it out. That's all I have for this evening. Thank you, Mayor. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, John. Um, Ms. Huffman. Nothing tonight. Just thanks again for your support. Okay. And we do have executive session tonight? Yes, sir. All right. All right. Ms. Uh, Duncan, anything further? Uh, last week on the 6th of April um, at the county commissioner's meeting, I was attending virtually and Ms. Susan Whelan read a personal letter from the public uh, stating how she appreciated the vaccination clinic here in Fountain and how flawless the process was. I just want to continue to give a shout out to uh, our health department and our and and our uh, clinic here in Fountain and how good of a job that they're doing and the public does appreciate she read a personal letter and just to our local public health office uh, for making good and making sure that we have enough vaccinations. I uh, really appreciate that. 
All right, thank you. Yeah, and all the all the work that she and that and that group have done. Uh, wow, it's a lot. Okay, Mr. Geek, anything further? I just want to thank Troy and Todd for the Mondays and Fridays. And I didn't attend virtually on Monday, but I watched it later, and I did attend virtually on Friday. And I think there were a lot of good comments on both nights. Thank you. All right, it's on. Oh, good. Mr. Applegate. <laughs> Yeah, same thing. It was that was good meetings that you guys did, and it was. So I don't know how you do it. <laughs> but congratulations. <laughs> All right. Um, hold on, real quick, Miss Estes. I'm going to go to Mayor Pro Tem first. Ah, nothing. Uh, nothing more from me tonight. Thanks. Okay, then Miss Estes. Just want to join the bandwagon and say congrats to Troy and Todd for putting together a great meeting on the single hauler issue. I learned a lot. I was on both nights listening to everybody and I've been reading all the comments online. I appreciate everybody giving us their comments because it's going to be a tough decision, but we need to hear from everybody. So I really encourage everybody to get in on that blog. And second thing, I want to give a shout out to all the medical laboratory professionals as they celebrate Medical Laboratory Professionals Week next week, April 18th to the 24th. It is an annual celebration of medical laboratory professionals and pathologists who play a vital role in healthcare and patient advocacy. And that's the ones that are doing all those COVID-19 tests. So good shout out to all my cohorts that worked in the laboratory. Thank you. All right, awesome. All right, thanks, Ms. Estes. Ms. Thompson? No, thank you. Okay, um, I don't have anything else. I think, uh, again, just please, um, uh, and I actually I do, I meant to say this to the developers who were here earlier um, from Ventana. I just wanted to publicly thank them. Um, they kind of went above and beyond in having those public meetings um, prior to any of this, just to, to, to kind of get it out there. And, and uh, we've asked others before and they've not really taken us up on it, but they, they, they kind of stuck their put the door and try to get some uh, work going on that. So I just wanted to thank them for, for at least attempting that and, and building a relationship with not only the city, but also the, the community that they're gonna affect the most and those residents that live next door. So thank you to them. Um, with that, we will um, we do have an ex executive session this afternoon. How do we need to go with this? Thank you. I'd like to request an executive session pursuant to CRS section 24-6-424 for the purpose review, approval, and amendment of executive session minutes and an executive session pursuant to CRS section 24-6-424B for the purpose of receiving legal advice on specific legal questions. Okay, council, Mr. Uh, Mayor Portel. I move to go into executive session as requested. And Mr. Geek. Second. We have a motion and second for approval for executive session, Ms. Huffman. Mayor Ortega, how do you vote? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Lauer, how do you vote? Yes. Council member Thompson, how do you vote? Yes. Council Member Estes, how do you vote? Yes. Council Member Applegate, how do you vote? Yes. Council Member Geek, how do you vote? Yes. Council Member Duncan, how do you vote? Yes. Seven yes. Motion carried. Okay, we um, will go in executive session. Give us about five minutes. Uh, everyone to call in. Uh, our next regular meeting is April 27th. We will see you then. Bye. <laughs>